In episode 4 of the Skirmish War Games Hobby Vlog, we make custom spider cocoons for use in Ranges of Shadow Deep or your favorite RPG. Well, hi folks, this is Lee from SkirmishWarGames.com. I'm here with Lynn. Hello. And uh, this is episode 4 of our Hobby Vlog, and as we've been threatening, today we're going to talk about making some uh, custom spider cocoons for Rangers of Shadow Deep. So not too long ago, we uh, got a copy of the Rangers of Shadow Deep uh, Deluxe Edition book. And inside there's uh, various scenarios for uh, playing Rangers of Shadow Deep. And I think the second one, the Infected Trees, uh, requires some spider cocoons for that scenario. So we didn't really have any on hand. And so we thought, well, let's put our uh, creativity cap on and see if we can make some custom uh, spider cocoons. So like a lot of the things that we do, the uh, video you're seeing here is actually our first attempt. So we didn't practice or anything. We just sort of winged it and uh, recorded it as we went. And so what you see is our first stab at uh, making some spider cocoons. And actually, Lynn sort of started off this process, and she used a couple of different techniques to uh, get what you're seeing on the screen right now. So we're going to walk you through that and uh, see what you think. Okay, Lynn, this uh, first part is all you, so give us a sense of what's going on here. So you need something to represent the body inside the cocoon. You could use steel stick, quick wood, green stuff, or some other type of material that you want to work with to make the form. I chose steel stick because it's inexpensive, easy to work with, and it sets up really quick. Anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes, depending on the weather in your area, humidity, and heat. So the goal at this point is just to make some vaguely humanoid-shaped lumps, correct? Yeah, you don't need anything really detailed because you're going to just be covering it up with thread. Okay, it looks like you've created quite a few spider victims there. So these will be the individual mummies as opposed to the big cocoon clusters that are going to come later. Correct. So now that our steel stick is set, I can take this big spool of thread that I got for $3 and wrap it around our forms to make our cocoons. And as you can see, there's green yarn on the one and there's a little bit of red yarn poking through the other one. I didn't know if it would show through in the end, but it was worth a shot. So that might have been clothing, actually, that they were wearing that might have shown through the thread. Exactly. So I don't know if these are adventurers or a bunch of uh, hapless villagers, but they're all uh, wrapped up in thread, and now you have other plans for them, correct? Yeah, the next step. The next step. Which apparently is going to involve plaster of Paris. You wouldn't want them to unravel now, would you? No, not at all. This is easy to find at Walmart or Home Depot, and it's fairly inexpensive as well. We're going to mix up a couple of tablespoons according to the directions. That should be all we need for our purposes. And how long does that take to mix up? Not long at all, as long as it takes to stir it. Okay. And now the dunking begins. Now the dunking begins. Just drop them in and put them on parchment paper once you've wiped off some of the excess. Oh, okay, so it won't stick. Yeah, otherwise that'll stick to paper towels or cardboard or stuff like that. So that was your procedure for individual cocoons, and now you're making some clusters. And for the foundation here, that's actually red wax from the outside of uh, individual Baby Bell cheeses. Yeah, why not? Since I didn't need to wrap it, it doesn't need to be quite as sturdy. So I just took a bunch of thread and dunked it in mass and then just draped it over it, which gives a totally different look. So it depends on what style you want for your cocoons. So it's a blanket of plaster of Paris thread, basically. Yes. And you try to kind of put it in between so it gives it the lumps for the bodies. Okay, here's our batch of uh, cocoon clusters and individual cocoons. The plaster of Paris actually was kind of porous, so when we started to uh, dab on a little bit of wash on there, it started to soak in. So we began by spraying these with a clear sealant, though we also could have sprayed them with uh, like a gray primer, which would have given us a very different uh, foundation to work with. So maybe we'll try that next time. This is all one big experiment, so we're going to try a variety of uh, washes and shades to see if we can get the tone that we want. And I'm going to start with some uh, gray armor wash from Vallejo, just because I have it in my head that maybe these cocoons should be gray, though we also have a blue-gray that we can work with, too. So that'll be sort of the first colors we're working with. So, Lynn, you actually started dry brushing these with a little bit of bone first, uh, and then found that that kind of soaked in, and then you sealed them. Yeah, then we sealed them so that it wouldn't soak in so weird. And then you decide you want me to do it. Yes, because you're better <laughs> at shading than me. <laughs> so anyway, we're just kind of winging it here, but uh, that's what it looks like with some of the original bone and then uh, some of the blue-gray shade on there. So as you can tell, this is going to be a little bit of a process to sort of build it up and get the color we want. And here's one of the individual mummies that you kind of wrap tightly in thread as opposed to uh, dipping the thread in the plaster and then laying it on in a big sheet. 
And I kind of like the fact that we have a couple different looks. So uh, we have some individual mummies to use as scatter terrain, and then some big cocoon clusters to lay out uh, in larger clumps. Since the plaster is a little bit crumbly, I decided it'd be best to abase these guys. So I actually had one leftover resin base in my collection that I thought might work well. And those are fitting in there really nice. Yeah, it's uh, got divots in it that are just made for cocoons. And here's one of the larger cocoon clusters. And as you can see, there's some of the uh, Baby Bell cheese wax on the bottom. So nothing goes to waste. Everything can be made into terrain. I'm going to put this one on a base as well. But because the uh, bottom is a little uneven, I'm going to need to build up around it with some uh, basing material to kind of fill in those gaps. So I have it in my head that these cocoons should be gray. I don't know if that's from uh, watching the second Hobbit movie where the dwarves got uh, caught by the Mirkwood spiders. But we're going to use that Vallejo model wash again at the beginning to try to uh, build up some tone here. Had we primed all of these gray to begin with, then we could have sort of built up lighter colors on top using a dry brush and uh, some white or some bone or other lighter colors. But this is kind of in reverse. So the lighter color, the white, is underneath. And then eventually the uh, darker threads will be on top. But I think it worked out okay in the end. I primed all the bases a Rust-Oleum Caramel color. And I'm going to use a little Hunter Green on the top of this resin one too to kind of replicate the look of grass. So there's the resin base with a little uh, Hunter Green on top on the right. And then a flat uh, Caramel colored base on the left. And as you can see, the divots in this uh, resin base just uh, accommodated these cocoons perfectly. So we just have to figure out what sort of pattern we want. However, I think my cocoons are still too white, so I'm going to go ahead and take some uh, Earthshade and some Sepia and kind of dab in a modeled uh, pattern on both of them just to kind of break up all of that white. And I think the final step that kind of made it work for me was uh, I dry brushed some Dawnstone over the outer threads so they would contrast with the white underneath a little bit more. Then I used some Vallejo Earth Texture to kind of build up around the edges of this cocoon cluster and fill in some of those gaps. This is basically just mud and it comes in a large container so I can dab it on with abandon. Looks like peanut butter to me. It is peanut butter. Here, try some. Okay, we're getting pretty close to the end here. I glued some uh, cocoons to the resin base and I'm going to touch up that green stuff with a little brown. And that earth texture did a nice job of filling in the uh, gaps around the edge of the cocoon cluster. So that's looking pretty good. I think the uh, scenario in Rangers of Shadow Deep calls for five cocoon terrain pieces. So we're going to make a few smaller ones as well. Here's a uh, larger individual cocoon on an individual base. And here's the multiple victim terrain pieces. And all of them are looking spiderific. So I'm pretty happy with how this is turning out. I especially like the one with the three individual cocoons on it. That's my favorite. Yeah, that's actually Aragorn, Merry, and Pippin. And for the final touch, I'm going to dry brush on some niblet green over this earth texture to kind of create a quick and dirty look of uh, scattered weeds and grass. Okay, I think we're going to call that good for now. So that is three out of the requisite uh, five cocoon clusters that we need to have for Rangers of Shadow Deep. And Lynn, what do you think about this project? It was pretty fun. I enjoyed it. And I guess we should point out that the uh, version here I'm showing that has the plaster of Paris string kind of draped over the bodies was much quicker than the individual wrapped mummies that you made that uh, are on the far right there. The individually wrapped ones definitely took a lot longer. They took anywhere from five to ten minutes, depending on the size, to get them all wrapped and ready to go for the dipping. <laughs> I foresee a new Etsy store in your future. Lynn's hand-wrapped giant spider cocoons. Each one made with love. Carefully crafted by artisans in the art of victim wrapping. I don't know. I think that's going to come after working on the pile of shame. And actually, that's a good segue, because... This is episode four of our vlog, our hobby vlog, and episode five, when we get to it, hopefully here in the near future, is going to talk about uh, our pile of shame, our mountain of shame uh, that we have been working diligently on. So one of the things we've been doing this summer, we realize we have a pretty short window before we get into the fall and winter, and there's a lot of games we want to play, and one of the big sort of uh, choke points has been we don't have some of the miniatures we need when a game comes up, and so we have to drop everything try to paint a bunch of stuff, a bunch of terrain, and a bunch of minis, and it's kind of a drag. It would be nicer to have all that stuff ready to go. And so we're actually putting some of the battle reports on hold for the next six weeks while the weather is good and working really hard on whittling down that pile of shame. So you painted up the spiders we see here. You've been making terrain. You painted some knolls, some skavens. What else? Some dwarves. 
some, some dwarves, goblins. Some goblins. I've been working on filthy peasants and uh, a frost grave team and a bunch of other stuff. But we'll talk about that in uh, vlog episode five and kind of show you what we're working on and what we hope to complete. And uh, hopefully that'll help us uh, maintain our momentum. And uh, if we can get half the stuff on our wish list done that we would like to get done, that'll be a victory. And then we can just play games all winter. Yeah, we can play games all winter long and uh, get some of those battle reports done that we've been promising people. So we look forward to that. But in the meantime, folks, thanks very much for checking out the vlog. And until we talk again, be well, have some fun, play some games, paint some minis. And as Robocop would say, stay out of trouble. And watch out for giant spiders. And watch out for giant spiders.